Hello, and welcome to another episode of Leadership Table Talk, a show designed to help you develop and improve your leadership and management skills and talents. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Gillum, a retired Air Force Colonel and former member of the Senior Executive Service Corps with the Department of Defense at the Pentagon. In addition to being a number one Amazon best-selling author of 12 books, I am the owner of M2G Dynamic Leadership Solutions, LLC, and the creator of the board game, The Leadership Build Zone. As a small business owner, I have experienced many challenges from different perspectives. Today's episode is entitled, Attorney Chat, What Every Small Business Owner Should Know. Just to be clear, I am not an attorney, but I have a good friend with me today, and she has agreed to share with us her wisdom on this topic. Please help me to welcome attorney Katherine Larkin, who prefers to be called Katie. So Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mary. I'm glad to be here. Uh, absolutely. Now, Katie, let's just start by uh, telling the audience a little bit about your background. Well, I'm a corporate attorney. I have over 15 years experience in business law. And um, although I've lived in Virginia most of my life, uh, or probably a good portion of my life, and I graduated high school and went to college here and law school, I was from the West Coast and I'm a military brat and I had a military spouse. So I've traveled all over um, and I consider this my home now. Oh, oh, good. Now, Katie, what motivated you to actually go into law? Well, like a lot of people, I think I was, I thought there was a right and wrong way to do things. I thought there was a rule book. And I thought that if I went to law school, that I would learn this little bo rule book. And, um, and also, so, you know, in my daily life as a teenager and then a college student, I would see things and I would wonder how they worked and um, how come you know, certain trials were, were decided a certain way or how come certain people had to pay sums of money and, and I didn't understand so I thought that would be really interesting to go to law school and I found though that um, it's actually there's no right, right or wrong, there's no rule book and um, the facts and the circumstances and um, the rules governing the situation really matter and so um, it, it just broadened my horizon. So I'd always wanted to go, but um, it, I didn't learn what I thought I would learn. Oh, wow. So Katie, as a military spouse, uh, how did you maintain your law uh, expertise while you were traveling and all of that? Well, actually, my, um, my ex-husband was um, no longer active duty oh, okay. when I went into, the, um, into law school and then when I began my practice. But I have worked with um, uh, defense contractor clients and with former military um, uh, attorneys, and so I've, I've met a lot, but not as a military spouse. Okay, so Katie, getting down to the nitty gritty here, when it comes down to small business, why is it important for small business owners to consult with an attorney before they go into business? Well, it's um, larger businesses always have attorneys on staff before they begin some sort of venture. And so they've uh, budgeted for that. And, and they understand the value, the owners understand the value of legal services. A new and small business owner, however, may not have that kind of um, background or insight. And so they often are beginning a, a business even without knowing it such as the woman or man who makes um, wedding cakes on the side or fixes um, engines in the garage on the weekends. And those businesses may start to build, but they didn't really consider them as businesses, so they've already started down the road, never considered a, an attorney or anything like that. So I don't think that you have to consult an attorney before opening a business. Um, I think that um, the savvy business person, however, becomes educated about things. And when that business person realizes that there are some things that they can't get, the same way I did when I was thinking about law school, when, when they feel that maybe there's a right or wrong answer, but they can't seem to narrow it down from all the research they're doing or the people they're talking to, at that time they should 
likely look for um, a seasoned business attorney to ask questions to maybe take an hour of their time and um, and try to understand some of the things that have been bothering them about their business. But uh, just to summarize, mm -hmm. I don't think that it, you have to do it before you go into business. Mm -hmm. it's, certainly, it's certainly an option, but uh, for small business owners especially, um, it, it's not a requirement. I, I know when I was first going into business, there was this book that was out, uh, What You Should Ask Your Attorney, and um, not, not your attorney, but your accountant, what mm -hmm. every small business owner should ask their accountant. So let me just flip that script a little bit here. From a attorney perspective, what would you say are some key questions that a small business owner should consult with an attorney about, especially during the startup phase or whatever? Sure. Um, well, first of all, what the taking the title from your accountant's book, um, <laughs> what I would expect a business owner to ask me or an attorney, another attorney, a business attorney would be, you know, when I graduated from law school, what bars I'm admitted to, um, you know, that's where I'm licensed, mm -hmm. and um, how long I've been practicing, and how I can add value to that small business person's business, and what, what it is that I bring to the table. Um, and just off the top of my head, some of the things that I can think of are um, helping the business owner to form the entity. You said in the beginning that you own an LLC. And there are, there's numerous um, books and resources on the web about how you can go about doing that. And you don't really need an attorney to do it, but you may not understand all the ramifications. And working with your accountant is also a good idea because there are tax implications of the form of entity that you end up using. So you, um, you could benefit and get value by talking to an attorney before you enter into some sort of form of business. And um, you could also learn um, what provisions in your agreements would be important and what kind of boilerplate maybe you should or should not have. Um, so you, you could help, the attorney could help you understand whether, you know, what, what specific issues like pricing or supply agreements, things like that, um, if those are very important to you, then the attorney can help you make sure that those provisions in your standard contracts are very robust. So those are just a couple things I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, Katie, those were wonderful. I'm quite sure our guests are going to be very, very uh, pleased with getting that type of information and so forth. You talked about LLC. Are there other types of business structures that business owners can uh, engage in? Yes, and um, it's uh, most people um, that start a small business, like our uh, wedding cake maker, or our engine manufacturer, fixer-upper, they um, do something that's called a sole proprietorship, and they they don't have to take any steps. Just by fixing that engine and accepting cash or some other kind of trade for that, they've entered into business. Um, they have maximum flexibility on how they run their business, but on the other hand, um, they have no shield against personal liability. So if they um, do this small business on the side and they own a house and they own some other property, all of that would be up for grabs by creditors in the case something went wrong with the business. So they're not, they're, they're not shielded from their business's losses. And I'm not talking about fraud, I'm talking about something where um, events go, um, I can't think of something, in the wedding cake, um, sugar, you can't get sugar now and it, the price has tripled um, and so orders get fallen behind and, um, and sh the person making the cakes is unable to fulfill all the orders and there's just a catastrophe um, in, in that case because there is no um, formal entity, um, the personal um, assets would be um, at risk to um, before that business could file bankruptcy. Now, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm speaking in very broad um, terms just for your audience yes. to know that um, this is just me speaking um, about um, non-specific facts. Yeah. Um, but the other entities, so once you've started a business, if you hadn't considered um, what you wanted to do, um, once you decide that maybe you do want some some personal um, liability protection, um, the the um, traditional form is a corporation, and we think of you know all these big corporations in our lives, um, but those are very formal and they're expensive, and they're not really necessary for small business owners. 
and, um, and they can be very cumbersome for small business owners. So over time, um, states adopted something, and it's actually a, a more of a federal income tax um, a provision, but there's a way to make a corporation um, what's called an S Corp, which is after the IRS's chapter on that. And it allows for, um, for this pass through of taxable um, uh, income to the owner, but it provides that shield against personal liability. So if I step back to the corporation, a corporation is its own entity. We can think of it as a box, and the owners are outside of it. But the box itself is taxed, or um, if it if it um, makes a bad deal, it is liable for the consequences, but not the owners generally. Mm -hmm. So in an S corp, um, it's still a box, but there's dotted lines around the box. So um, it's it the income that the profit that's coming into the entity is going actually reported by the owner. It, the owners, if there are more than one, but there are many restrictions on having an S corporation, and um, and so it's really only for small businesses that aren't going to try to tap into the public market and things like that. So it's very specific. Um, and then over time, um, states came up with something called the limited liability company, which is what you've yeah. done, and that provides the best of both both worlds for most, not most, for many business owners, small business owners, because it. I, in my mind, I see it as a triangle, and it would be dotted lines because um, the the profit or income is still going directly to the owners, but the um, it's set up in a way that will provide personal liability for the um, for the owners, and the liability will be will stay with the um, with the the LLC. So um, so those are just three forms, and there are many variations on that that's just too hard to get into now. It would be, it'd be funny if I could draw you pictures, but <laughs> I won't do that, so. Oh, Katie, that was just wonderful, all that information. I know our audience is really appreciating that, that you've taken the time to actually provide this kind of information, because I know if we were to contact you and get on your schedule, which is very, very busy, that, uh, you know, I, I just am very, very glad that you're here to do this for our audience today. So, uh, Katie, uh, let's talk a little bit about your business. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes here before we go to break. So, your particular business, you are a um, sole proprietor, is that? That's right. I, um, I'm, I'm formed as a professional LLC, um, but that's because I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I cannot have certain forms. Okay. Um, however, um, I'm, so basically I am a sole proprietor um, because all of the liability for my, my services are still with me. Yes. So I cannot yeah. shield myself from yeah. malpractice. So that's how that works. But um, in, in the kind of business that I do, um, I um, work because I'm uh, licensed as myself. Um, it's, it's really just me that you're working with. Um, so if that if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Well, it looks like we have just come up on our first break. Where did the time go today? Well, anyway, please stay tuned and we will be back with you shortly. My grandfather served in World War II. Spending time with him were the best memories of my life. I became a physician at VA because of my grandfather, so I can help others like him. I can't imagine working with better doctors or a more dedicated staff. I'm fulfilling my life's mission with the help of my team and thanks to these veterans. I'm proud to be a doctor at VA and proud to honor my grandfather every day. Search VA Careers to find out more. Welcome back to Leadership Table Talk. My guest today is attorney Katherine Larkin. So Katie, let's just uh, pick up where we left off and talk a little bit about contracts. Why is it important for small business owners or any business owner to make sure that they consult with an attorney before they sign any contract? It's, an, it's important, it's not so much important that they consult before signing any contract, but I would definitely advise them to be contract savvy. And in order to do that, they need to be educated. And there are lots of resources for that that are free or low cost. Um, the, the counties provide things, there's community-based um, resources, and also the Small Business Administration has a lot of free information. And I say that because um, I've taught classes um, to small business owners before on 
what's important in a contract. And to my mind, you want it to be as clear and concise as possible. So as short and as um, uh, easy English as possible. And so I will tell people that if you don't understand the provision that you're reading, then it's likely the other side doesn't understand it also. And so it's okay to line through that if you can't understand, if they can't provide an explanation for you because it's possible they've taken a form from someone else. So there's a lot of agreements out there that are just what I would call boilerplate, which I had mentioned earlier. Um, and boilerplate is just um, uh, something that someone keeps bringing forward in a contract, but sometimes no one's actually read it to understand what it means. And you'll see it also where it'll be all caps. Yes. And it can be very yeah. difficult to read, and if you work with something like Word, you know that that won't even pick up misspellings. So um, as, as an attorney in-house, which I was an attorney for a biotechnology company, and I worked with their contracts, um, I had to read all of our own boilerplate to make sure that it made sense, and sometimes it didn't. And sometimes if I couldn't make sense of it, then I had to figure out, well, maybe it's something I'd never come across because I, wasn't, I hadn't been a biotech um, attorney before. Um, but once I cleared that, I thought, well, maybe a mistake was made, so we need to clean this up. Uh, and it's the same for anyone in business. Um, so I say when I'm teaching the class, what are your most important pieces, pricing, uh, delivery dates, um, maybe some kind of specifications. If those are your most important things, they should be on the first or second page. They should be very clear. You should be able to agree that what's on that page is what you want to happen. And if that's true, and there are no other pieces on that agreement that say um, that you don't understand, then you should be fine. And you don't need anyone else to review the contract. On the other hand, um, for your own business, if you have standard contracts, um, a, a seasoned business attorney can add a great amount of value by reading those agreements, just like I did for my in-house client, and seeing what they say, and then making sure that that's what the business owner really wants. Because sometimes that's not really what the business owner wants because of this boilerplate that's come through, or they inherited a contract, or sometimes they like someone else's contract and so they'll just adopt it to use. Um, and so it should always be tailored for that business and that's where an attorney can add value. Oh, absolutely. Now, uh, Katie, would you say that for every business owner, they should make sure that they understand themselves what's in the contract and maybe work with the attorney to uh, understand it for, you know, as best they can? Because I know a lot of times uh, with uh, accountants, sometimes we may take and turn everything over to the accountant and never really understand the real operations of the business itself from a financial perspective. So from a legal perspective, would you recommend that the CEO or whoever make sure that they do work with their attorney to understand and not just say, okay, here, you take care of it and I'm gonna wash my hands of it. What would you say to the CEO who just does that and never even looks at any of their documentation from a legal perspective? Right, I think that would not be a good idea idea. Uh, I don't think that they need to know everything about the contract, but if the contracts are written in plain English, then almost anyone, no, uh, you know, a non-lawyer should be able to understand them. And it's when you don't understand what you're reading that I would be concerned. Um, so yes, I think that everyone in that organization that um, has some management decision making should be able to understand the agreements they're using. Now, specific industries have, and, and contracting with the government, there's a lot of boilerplate that doesn't necessarily make sense, but your seasoned business attorney can say, yes, this is standard for this, this um, field that we're in. Everyone uses this. It doesn't make sense outside of this field, but in this field, it's okay, and that's been vetted. So then you can take that as, um, as you know, take that to the bank. No, I'm just kidding, but um, but that way you have your, um, you, you know, your your um, management should know what's in their contracts uh, because that's where when things do go south that's what you have to stand behind or in front of depending on which one you're trying to either enforce it or guard against. And you want to make sure that it says what you thought it said when you signed. Because the court is going to look at it as its own document and it's going to say, well, this is what you signed. 
Um, and there are cases where you can bring in outside information, but it's very difficult to do that. So your contract should be as robust as possible, and, a, and a, an attorney can make sure that's, that is, it is robust, and also can make sure that you as the business manager or owner will understand what kinds of provisions are in there. Um, for example, um, one thing that just I just thought of, sometimes when you have a standard agreement and you go out to a lot of different organizations, they may have a reason why they object to a provision, a state of law, choice of law provision, something like that. Um, if you understand your contract or if you have in-house attorneys, you can easily negotiate that piece. But if you don't understand your contract, then you don't really know what you're giving up if you change that. So, uh, Katie, what would you say are some other uh, pitfalls that uh, small business owners can fall into if they're not uh, attorney savvy or legally savvy, if you will? <laughs> Sure. Well, some of them, um, I, I think a large majority of the business owners that I've um, met and worked with, um, they are not as, I think contracts are probably one of the scariest pieces for them because there is a lot of boilerplate and legalese that doesn't need to be in there. Um, so I would say that some of the places that they get the most caught up is in having these agreements that try to handle every known contingent and even unknown contingents and the more you start going off into the future the less uh, the less robust your agreement becomes because you're opening up all kinds of possibilities and you don't know how that will play out so um, so I would say an attorney can provide value there and help with any pitfalls because you they'll know when the agreement is just a lot of extra things. It's not really helping the business owner. Another thing is um, in, in deciding upon the form of um, entity that you may go into, whether it makes sense to be a corporation or a partnership, which we didn't speak about, but a partnership is, has, um, is similar to an LLC in the pass-through benefits, but um, it doesn't have the personal liability shield. Um, for the most part. So, um, but if you wanted to go into one of these different kinds of forms, your attorney can help you decide what's best for your business, what's best for the um, what you're going to be um, working in that field. Also, if in the future you would like to tap into the public market and maybe go public because you have some great widget that's going to make millions of dollars, mm -hmm. then you would want a certain form because you um, you don't want to start out as an LLC generally and then have to convert to an, a corporation so that you can um, access public markets um, because of tax reasons so and and some other reasons um, and in that same vein an attorney can make sure that you are following the state and um, um, requirements for those entities to make sure that um, you're in compliance because if you do open a business under a, a kind of form like a corporation or an LLC, there are requirements for when meetings are held and, um, and how you um, separate personal from business assets. So, uh, Katie, let me ask you before we uh, end up for today, what is the difference between a copyright, a trademark, and a patent? Can you share sure. with us? Sure. A copyright okay. is something that governs um, uh, original um, work of art or um, something spoken, I mean, sorry, spoken written. Um, and a trademark is a slogan or um, a name. And, um, and then a patent is an invention that um, has a limited property right that's governed by the that's given by the government in exchange for opening up that information to the public. So there's a, a, a period of time where no one can actually use that. You have exclusive use in the patent side. And I, I have to say that patent, uh, copyright and trademark can be handled by many business attorneys, but patent law is its own specialization and you would be required to seek out and you would be smart to seek out um, an experienced patent lawyer. They have um, very stringent requirements, and they also have to be a member of the patent bar. So, um, but so that is the difference. Wow! <laughs> so that is wonderful to know. So, 
if a person has invented something before they start dealing with people, they should always maybe get a non-disclosure agreement. Would you recommend? I think that's a great idea. A non-disclosure agreement because, um, or a confidentiality agreement, they're the same thing, depends on what you're asking the person to do. But here's where a, a perfect example of boilerplate. There's a lot of boilerplate in standard, what we would call CDAs, confidentiality agreements. And some of them don't make sense and don't protect you. So you would wanna make sure before you or anyone else enters into one, um, that if you want someone to look at your invention and you want them to sign this agreement, so that they can't then take the invention and run with it. You want to make sure that agreement really does provide protection for you and that if the person still runs with that um, invention, that there's some enforcement ability for you. And that's where an attorney would help you. So, uh, Katie, before we get out of here, I want to make sure I give you the opportunity to tell people how they can find out more about you and your company. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, it's um, my probably the fastest way to reach me would be through email, and it's larkinlawyer at gmail.com. Absolutely fantastic. Katie, it has truly been a wonderful uh, time here with you today. I want to thank you for allowing um, just coming and being a part of the program. It looks like we've just ran out of time and I would love to have you back. Would you like to come back sure. in the future? Because you've got so much information. We didn't even crack the surface of everything that we wanted to talk about today. So I'm gonna definitely plan to have you back on the show. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in today to Leadership Table Talk. I hope that you have been inspired by our guests and all the information that she had to share with us today. And we will We'll definitely bring her back. And so if you have any questions at all about today's show, please contact me at my website, m2gleadershipbiz.com. Again, thank you for watching, and I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.